I want to start by throwing it to you on the history of Orphan's Promise. There may be some people watching who don't know about the history, why you formed the organization, and the work that you do. Sure. Well, 20 years ago, my husband and I found ourselves um, in our 50s. We had four children, two biological, two adopted, and um, we were just kind of comfortably going through life and heard the story of three sisters in Ukraine who uh, were potentially going to be split up so that they could go to different homes to have a family. And God just began to burden my heart with the fact that they were not to be split up. We didn't know anything about them. We didn't know their ages, their names, anything. But we began to follow the leading of the Lord, and we went and pursued adopting. And a short time later, less than a year later, we came home with three new daughters from Ukraine who were 9, 11, and 13. Um, and we thought that we were just being obedient to the Lord about that very specific uh, situation. And we came home, and in short order, our friends were saying, you know, Mama, Papa, can you find a home for our friends? Of course, they spoke no English. We, we, um, had, we worked with Natalia, actually. That's how she and I became friends. She was getting her uh, master's degree at Regent University, and, and we just hired her to come to our house a couple of days a week to help us talk to our kids. In the process of that, we were struck, Natalia and I were both struck by the fact that 99% of children who are in orphanages worldwide will never have families. They will never be adopted. So while we were happy with our family situation and we were moving on in all of that, our hearts were burdened for the 99%. You know, we said, what happens to them? So we, I'm so glad we're on a prayer event today because honestly, that's how Orphan's Promise began. Natalia and I, for two years, walked around our neighborhoods at night and just prayed, just prayed and said, God, we're two little people and our hearts are burdened for these children. Family is your idea. What can we do? As time went on, uh, we had a center that started in Kiev, Ukraine, because CBN had an office there. Uh, we just we talked about what would it look like if we could help children who were going to age out at 16, which is what happens to kids in these orphanages, you know, no family history, uh, no knowledge of how to manage money, they don't cook for themselves, they don't know how to buy their own clothes, and we said, what would give them a leg up in the world? And so we said, well, if they could speak English, that would probably put them a notch above everybody else. Um, what if they could do computers and do computers well? That would give them job opportunities. And then we knew that you can change the circumstances in the lives of children. But if you don't change their hearts, if you don't change that orphan spirit that's in them, then it, it'll all be for naught. So we started what we call the school of life. And it was really how to do the things I mentioned, how to cook, how to iron your clothes, how to have a job interview. It was the computers. It was even music. It was language. But the bottom line was, who is God? Who is God to me? And who am I to God? And, you know, in the beginning, the kids kind of bucked that because it was sort of like, you know, I, I don't really need that. Give me the computer. Give me the okay. English. But at one point, we had to revamp some classrooms that they were meeting in. And you know what they didn't want to let go of? the school of life. Because for the first time, things were making sense to them. For the first time, somebody was listening to their questions, listening to their hearts about things, and they were learning that they were created with intention and with purpose. So at that time, we thought, well, what, what my heart really was, and eventually Nat's, we both have adopted children from Berdansk, which is uh, now in the south and in a uh, an area that is challenged. But let me just say, we wanted to go down where our kids were from and help their friends as they aged out of the orphanage there. So we opened a center there. We never had an idea that OP would grow the way that it has grown. I mean, that was so purely God. And I mention that to you because today we have more than 19 centers in Ukraine alone. But strategically around there, we have a center in Poland. We have a center in Romania. We have a center in Hungary. We have work in um, in the Balkans. We, ha You know, the in Moldova. 
And so I look at it and I think we are strategically positioned for the moment that we are all in right now. And I remember a time when we were waiting for our girls to come because adoption is a long legal process, especially internationally. And we had prepared their rooms and they weren't coming and they weren't coming. Somebody said their paperwork had been lost. And I stood at the side of of one of those beds and I just said, God, are these girls never coming? Was this just an exercise in faith? Because, you know, sometimes God does that in our lives. He says, are you willing to say yes? If I ask this of you, would you do it? And I said, Lord, if that's all it was, I accept that. And immediately into my heart, drop this word. This is not about the adoption of three girls. This is about changing the face of nations. I'm going to tell you, I stood in that bedroom and I thought, what in the world does that mean? All I wanted was my three daughters to come from Ukraine. I share this with you because I want you to understand the power of a yes in a person's life when God asks them to do something. Today, Orphan's Promise has hundreds of locations in over 60 countries. You're going to hear from staff. I I founded it, but I founded it with Natalia. We did this hand in hand from the beginning. Today, you're going to meet regional managers. We have them all over the world, but it is not because we're geniuses. It's because we said yes to God and God opened the windows of heaven and purposed all of this to happen. Today, we're here to pray for Ukraine. When I look at the situation there, we are able to get into Ukraine to supply food, to supply baby goods, to supply clothing, to supply a safe place for someone to sleep on their way out. You know what? To supply hope. Hope to people who are not wanting to leave their country. They love their country. This is home for them. We stand side by side with every Ukrainian, whether they are there or whether they have exited, to say, God has a way. This is a David and Goliath situation, and we are believing that David is once again going to win, not because he's strong enough, but because of this scripture, not by might nor power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And we stand with Ukraine in that regard. Terry, that is so that is so powerful. I love what you said about the power of of yes, right? You know, you go back those many years now, <clears throat> you had no idea that this was going to happen where we are right now. And for a lot of people at this moment, they're sort of encountering Ukraine for the first time. They're hearing about things in Ukraine for the first time. And, you know, many people may not even be thinking about orphans per se and what happens to them in a, in a war zone. Can you talk just a little bit about what the situation was? Because by my understanding, you know, tens of thousands of orphans well before this situation in Ukraine, obviously your organization grew very fast helping you know, serve those orphans. Can you take us through the situation before uh, the Russian invasion? Sure. Well, I want to say when we went to get our girls or when we felt God was speaking to us about this, I had no idea where Ukraine was. I did not have a heart for Ukraine. I didn't know anything about it, but I, <laughs> I have fallen in love with it. But I want to tell you, when we went 20 years ago, it was a different place. The government was different. They were still coming out from under a communist mindset. Children weren't really high on the list of priorities. My kids and Natalia's daughter came out of an orphanage of 350 children. When my kids first went to that orphanage, my oldest daughter told me, you know, I didn't even know if my sisters were there. Two months after she was there, she ran into them on the playground, and that's how she knew that they were in the same facility. And so, you know, when you see this, Kids are meant to be nurtured and loved, taught to dream. They're our future. When you institutionalize a child, all of those things are missing. How do they know how to be a mama and a papa to their own children if nobody has been that to them? And so I saw that not just in the orphanage our kids were from, but we began to visit other orphanages around the country. You know, it was really a matter of uh, 
kids whose parents, for one reason or another, either had lost their lives, couldn't take care of them because of poverty, or were involved in drugs and alcohol. And the reason it was that was because things were so desperate there that they couldn't manage. They and and they resorted to that just to be able to survive themselves. But you know, God says He puts the lonely in families, and in those days. Uh, we saw children who longed for family, but I'll tell you something, they don't even know what they're longing for. They've never had it. And so, you know, when you adopt and a child then comes into a family, that's what they think they want, but they don't understand what that means. They're used to being a little bit, um, almost a little feral in their thinking, if you will, like a feral cat, you know, that they go and they they do what they want to do when they want to do it. If they want food, they sneak it however they feel they have to to get it. So there's a lot of mind change that has to go on in all of that. Um, you know, orphanages were kids who were considered second class, second rate in culture. You know, your own mother and father didn't want you. Why should I care about you? And we saw that in kids thinking all the time, all the time. That's one of the reasons they loved the school of life. Wow, somebody cares what I think. Somebody's willing to listen to me. They want to talk to me. I'm important. And so, you know, I see all of that very expensive to adopt internationally, lots of paperwork involved. I used to say, Billy, if you have a free bedroom in your house, go, <laughs> go and get a child and bring them home. I don't say that anymore because children who come from wounded backgrounds are wounded. They're broken inside. You know, even the Bible says before you build a house, count the cost. And so you need to do your homework if God touches your heart about this so that you get kids need healing. They need patience. They need understanding. And all of the kids that we saw that came out of here needed that. I want to say that kids who don't get adopted, this is the reason it's so important to have our centers in Ukraine. They fall into drug abuse themselves, alcoholism themselves, unwanted pregnancies, unexpected pregnancies. So now what are we doing? We're begetting another generation of kids who are in families that are incapable of taking care of them. Uh, not educated enough to really move forward in a meaningful fashion. Um, usually kids that are broken inside emotionally can be anywhere from two to four years uh, late in their development. And, and so they need nurture. You know, it's one of the reasons it's so important for us to be there invested in them. We're not there because of the war. We were there for years before the war. We've been there for 20 years and we've seen God do some amazing things. So we know that we have the capacity through doing what God's called us to, to change lives. And I want to say in doing that, I feel like we're raising a generation that could turn out to be the leaders of their nation because they understand the poor, they understand the need, they know where they've come from, and they understand who God is in their hearts and their lives. So I feel like we are investing in potential uh, leaders politically that could change the face of nations.